Join me, Terry Wogan, in London's Hyde Park on Saturday, the 9th of September, with guests including Lionel Richie, Ankela Georgiou, Alison Balsam, and the BBC Concert Orchestra for BBC Proms in the Park. BBC Two continues the incredible journey along the equator with Simon Reeve, now in Asia. Don't you worry about the flood, just concentrate on the football. Doesn't quite work, does it? You are absolutely incredible. Equator. Woo. Sunday at 8 on BBC Two. At 10 o'clock, the news now on BBC One with Sophie Rayworth. Three people are killed, dozens are injured as Turkish holiday resorts are hit by blasts. There have been five explosions in 24 hours. Ten British tourists are among the injured. Jihad in Lebanon, a hostile reception for the UN Secretary General as he tours southern Beirut. New allegations tonight about how senior Lib Dems kept quiet about their former leader's drink problem. And a year on, President Bush tours the area hit by Hurricane Katrina as residents voice their anger. This is disgusting. This is heartbreaking. This, this, this is, this, this is my story. Good evening. Three people have been killed and dozens injured, including British tourists, in a series of bomb attacks on resorts in Turkey. A Kurdish separatist group said it carried out two of the attacks. The three victims died in an explosion in the southern city of Antalya this afternoon. Last night, three bombs went off in the resort of Marmaris, in injuring ten Britons, four of them seriously. From there, Sarah Rainsford reports. It was the fifth explosion in Turkey in less than 24 hours. This, the aftermath of the latest blast in Antalya. Three people died here. Local police say at least 20 more have been injured. It came after three blasts rocked Marmaris, another coastal resort town. A bomb was planted on this minibus. Tourists and Turkish holidaymakers were the target. This is the height of the holiday season here, and these people have been out enjoying the clubs, restaurants and the bars. The Beckfords from the West Midlands were on the minibus, among ten British tourists who were injured. Ten-year-old Lewis and his family are still struggling to understand what happened to them. I'm still in shock. I'm sorry? I'm just wondering who caused it, why they do it to us. We, we, we haven't done anything. An armed Kurdish separatist group, TAK, linked to the outlawed PKK, has said it planted the bombs in Marmaris and another in Istanbul. It calls it revenge for the imprisonment of the PKK leader, Abdullah Öcalan. Kurdish separatists have targeted civilians in Istanbul before. And last July, TAK was linked to a bomb at the resort of Kushadasi. Five people, including a British tourist, were killed. They're trying to force the Turkish government to negotiate with them. They are unlikely to be successful because they tried it before and they failed before. But in the meantime, they have proved that they can harm the Turkish economy. The Turkish coast is hugely popular with British tourists. Almost two million come here every year. Most people here are trying to get on with their holiday and put what happened behind them. But there is fear here too. Many tourists have told me they worry there could be more bombs to come. They don't feel safe here any longer. Wait, I went to come home yesterday. Both of us went to book our tickets. So this morning we spoke to our rep. He said to me, oh, it was only a little bomb. It's not a big deal and things like that. You get really nervous when you're walking around now before we were all right to walk wherever we want to go. But now you feel a bit like apprehensive. Tonight, the British Foreign Office says it's still safe to travel here. But late this evening, Turkish police say they've foiled another attempted bombing, this time in Izmir on the west coast. Sarah Rainsford, BBC News, Marmaris. The United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan flew into Beirut today to help shore up the UN agreed ceasefire. He demanded that the two Israeli soldiers captured by Hezbollah be released, and he also asked Israel to lift its blockade of Lebanon. But as Ola Girin reports, his arrival wasn't welcomed by all. Flying into a changed Middle East, a place with new scars and new hatred. The UN Secretary General landed at Beirut Airport, still under an Israeli blockade, 
Just weeks ago, Israel was bombing the runways. Kofi Annan came hoping to strengthen the ceasefire, but ahead of him was an encounter with angry supporters of Hezbollah. First, talks with Lebanese leaders, including the Prime Minister, Fuad Senyura. Afterwards, Kofi Annan said Israel must lift its air and sea blockade of Lebanon, and he urged Hezbollah to release the two captured Israeli soldiers. I also renew my call for the abducted soldiers to be freed and as a first step to be transferred under the auspices of ICRC either to the, gov to the government of Lebanon or to a third party. Next stop, a Hezbollah stronghold, Beirut's southern suburbs, where Israel inflicted deep wounds during weeks of bombing. Crowds gathered to wait for the Secretary General. Hezbollah was expecting him. On these streets, it controls who comes and who goes. Then his convoy appeared, making its way through the ruins. But this was the greeting when Kofi Annan came into view. Within minutes, there was chaos. The security men closing in around him, getting ready for a hasty exit. Kofi Annan is now being rushed out of the area. He had an angry reaction here from crowds of Hezbollah supporters. They were chanting, God bless Hassan Nasrallah. This visit had been carefully coordinated, but the United Nations Secretary General came deep into Hezbollah territory and did not get the reaction he was expecting. There were no weapons visible, but hostile crowds were within inches of Kofi Annan. Was this engineered or spontaneous? We can't be sure. But it was a rough moment at the start of a difficult peace mission. Orly Guerin, BBC News, Beirut. Israel's Prime Minister has admitted that there were failures in the way Israel conducted its military operations in Lebanon. Ehud Olmert said there would be a government investigation, but has stopped short of ordering a full independent inquiry. Britain has requested the extradition of a man being held in Pakistan in connection with the alleged plot to blow up transatlantic flights. Rashid Rauf has been described by Pakistani officials as a key person in the terror investigation. But the Home Office said the extradition relates to a murder in Birmingham in 2002. The Defence Secretary, Des Brown, has visited Baghdad to discuss the handing over of security to Iraqi troops. He insisted he was seeing progress, but his arrival followed a weekend of suicide attacks across the country, which killed dozens of civilians and seven American soldiers. From Baghdad, Mike Waldridge reports. The bomber targeting the Ministry of the Interior got no further than a checkpoint outside the compound, but the explosion left a scene of destruction all too common in Baghdad. Inside, the minister was apparently due to hold a meeting with police chiefs. This hospital was soon, once again, receiving casualties. More frantic efforts to save lives. More lives lost. It's been a 24-hour period in which bombings have taken place in widely separated locations. This was one of two virtually simultaneous suicide bombings in the northern city of Kirkuk. Nine people died in the two bombings. American troops involved in the rescue efforts, and they've taken more casualties of their own in 24 hours than in a long while. An unpromising setting on the face of it for the British Defence Secretary's third visit to Iraq in four months. Each time I come, I see more progress. I recognise that there are continuing challenges and indeed we have seen some violence over this weekend which suggests that there is still much more work to be done. The continuing bombings are, according to the coalition and the Iraqi government, a deliberate attempt to disprove their insistence that there have been measurable results from the most recent push to lower the violence. And graduating today at the academy here, known as Sandhurst in the Sand, officers of the Iraqi army that's now increasingly in the front line of the battle against the bombers. Mike Aldridge, BBC News, Baghdad. 
At least 17 people have been killed after a suicide bomber attacked a market in the southern Afghan province of Helmand. Meanwhile, the British soldier killed in an attack in northern Helmand yesterday has been named. He was 22-year-old Lance Corporal Jonathan Hetherington of the 14 Signal Regiment. There have been fresh allegations tonight about the former Liberal Democrat leader Charles Kennedy and his drink problem. A new biography being serialised in the Times from tomorrow claims senior party figures deliberately kept quiet about Mr Kennedy's condition. Well, our political correspondent James Landell joins me now. Just tell us about these allegations, James. Well, essentially there are two main allegations. One is about the scale of Charles Kennedy's drink problem and also the extent to which um, his party tried to keep quiet about it. In terms of details about his own uh, drink problem, essentially when Charles Kennedy admitted it earlier this year he claimed he'd been fighting it for about 18 months this book claims that actually he was fighting it as long ago as 1999 when he even campaigned to become party leader it also gives some details about how you know, at its most acute he was unfit to perform uh, his public office in terms of what, what's been called the cover-up tonight essentially what happened was this three years ago Charles Kennedy almost went public with his um, drink problem. He thought, look, just get, get it off my chest. He told various colleagues about it. In the end, he changed his mind. But those colleagues include Sir Mingus Campbell, a current party leader. They all chose to keep that information from the electorate. You've spoken to the Lib Dems tonight. What do they have to say about it? Yeah, no official formal uh, response from either Mr Kennedy or Sir Mingus Campbell. And party spokesmen say we shouldn't expect anything from them. Essentially, their point is this. We're not going to deny any of these allegations. But secondly, they say, look, it's completely absurd and inappropriate to expect any MP to reveal in public uh, a medical condition that someone's just revealed to you. It's simply not uh, what's going to happen. It's not a cover-up. James, thank you. President Bush has begun a tour of America's Gulf Coast on the eve of the first anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. The disaster killed 1,500 people and caused nearly $100 billion worth of damage. The president arrived in Mississippi this evening, insisting that the government was listening to people's concerns despite criticism of his handling of the crisis. Well, our special correspondent, Gavin Hewitt, reports now from New Orleans. A year after Katrina, they are still tearing down properties, removing debris. In some areas, like the Lower Ninth, families are only now gutting their houses stripping the plaster, the mold. There is progress here, but painfully slow. Over 200,000 people have not returned to the city. Only one is actually living in this, on this block. So a year after Katrina, there's only one person. On, on this particular block. A year ago, 85% of New Orleans flooded. Thousands were stranded with little food and water, and these people, some of America's poorest, felt abandoned. Today, some neighborhoods remain shells, deserted. Residents like Angela Dupar return, but only for a few hours. Almost no one is living here. How can I live? There's nobody else on this block. Look, look at this. This is not fit for a dog. We're people. We are New Orleans. You know, how do they expect us to come back? As we went inside her house, her sense of loss is raw and hurting. This is, this is disgusting. This is heartbreaking. This, 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 is, this, this is my story. For many people, this is now home, trailer parks. Over 70,000 live in trailers, families like the Kellys. It has been 12 months of struggle waiting for their house to be restored. There is a lot of debris. Um, my kids were sick from the debris. My husband got really sick and almost died at one point. This is a typical suburban neighborhood where the water came over the houses. A year on, only 20% of the people have returned here. And you would expect there to be families here. In fact, just one has returned. And still on the street, there are piles of debris like this from houses that have been gutted. New Orleans is clawing itself back. But full recovery may take five years. Gavin Hewitt, BBC News, New Orleans. Cricket now and Pakistan put last week's ball tampering row behind them today, beating England in the 2020 match at Bristol. There had been speculation about whether the game would go ahead at all, but it did and the tourists reached their target with five wickets remaining and two and a half overs to spare. 
And Roy Keane has been confirmed as the new manager of Sunderland Football Club. The former Manchester United captain was at the Stadium of Light to see Sunderland beat West Brom 2-0 today. He signed a three-year deal immediately after the match. That's it from me. There's continuing coverage of all those stories on BBC News 24. Now on BBC One, it's time for the news where you are. Bye-bye. Good evening. The fire service says two people are lucky not to have been killed after falling 30 feet from a footpath into a ravine. The pair were hauled to safety by a specialist team at Thringston in Leicestershire. They'd fallen in the pitch black of the early hours of the morning. Mike O'Sullivan reports. A woodland footpath at Thringston near Colville. But there's danger at the edge, a ravine with a 30-foot drop. A woman and a man fell from the path in the early hours of yesterday. It's thought they were on their way home from a night out. The rope systems were then set up just here, uh, be laid onto the trees, um, and then we hauled them up. Uh, and we also had a hauling system that way as well to bring them up and across, and then the coaches were taken from here to the ambulance. The pair were hauled out in rigid stretchers. Leicestershire Fire Service's specialist rescue team had been called out by paramedics who couldn't get to the casualties. The woman, thought to be around 20, had suspected spinal injuries. Her companion, thought to be in his 30s, had a suspected broken ankle. The walkers came off the path through this vegetation, but it could have been even worse for them if they'd fell from the path only a few yards away, where there's a sheer drop along the rock face. It could have resulted in death here, you know, as we said. Uh, if they'd taken a tumble just five yards earlier, then it would have almost certain death. It took two and a half hours to get the casualties out. They were then taken to the Leicester Royal Infirmary. It's understood they've now been allowed home. Mike O'Sullivan, East Midlands Today, Leicestershire. Firefighters have spent most of the day at the scene of a house fire in Derby. Flames spread through a bedroom in the property on Broadway. The building is now said to be unstable. Derbyshire Fire and Rescue Service say arsonists may be to blame. An investigation will get underway tomorrow. An investigation has begun after an 18-year-old motorcyclist was killed at the British Superbike Championships in Lincolnshire. Ashley Martin suffered a major head injury when he crashed at the event at Cadwell Park near Louth. Angelina Sochi has the details. It's an event which attracts thousands of motorsport fans, but yesterday morning it was overshadowed by tragedy. Ashley Martin was on a section of the circuit known as the Gooseneck Corner when the accident happened. He was airlifted to hospital but later died. We had a team of specialised medics here, consultants in accident and emergency, who worked very hard on him here and then in the medical centre before we had him airlifted to Leeds General Infirmary with very major head injuries. This accident comes almost a year after another young biker was killed at the racetrack. Chris Jones, who was 14, died after he was involved in a multiple pile-up. A statement on the British Superbike Championship website says that the circumstances of the incident will be subject to investigation by the Motorcycle Circuit Racing Control Board and the relevant authorities. Angelina Sochi, East Midlands Today. A man has been seriously injured after the car he was travelling in crashed and landed in a river. Emergency services were called to the River Morn off Hermitage Lane in Mansfield. Police say the car veered off the road, crashed through a car park, hitting a lamppost before landing in the water. Several passengers in the car escaped with cuts and bruises, but fire crews took more than an hour to free the man. He was taken to hospital with serious injuries. A local security guard who doesn't want to be named says there have been accidents before. Most evenings I see different, different vehicles speeding excessively above the speed limit on this road and also on the new roads now adjoining the area. Uh, it's, out, it's out of town and they can speed to anything they want to realistically. At the top of the road there's families with children who are really worried about what goes on and we don't really know what, how to stop it really. Soldiers have been battling it out on the outskirts of a Nottinghamshire town today. 4,000 members of the Sealed Knot History Reenactment Group invaded Southern Racecourse. They were recreating scenes from the English Civil War. It was part of two days of mock battles in the town, which was where Charles II was arrested. 
when you come away for this weekend, you forget what you're doing. Some of our commanding officers don't have particularly highly paid jobs and some of our soldiers are very, very highly paid directors. Absolutely no class in here except the class of our armies. Now let's take a quick look at the East Midlands weather with Sarah. Thank you. Well, it's certainly been quite a blustery and showery bank holiday Monday. Now, the majority of the showers are starting to die away, just the odd rogue one remaining in places, and a minimum temperature tonight of 10 Celsius. Tomorrow will start off fine and dry. We will get to see some sunshine quite early on on Tuesday, but those showers soon starting to develop again and becoming quite widespread during the afternoon. Lighter winds tomorrow, though, so in the sunnier moments, it should feel a little bit better temperature-wise. We're looking at highs tomorrow of around 18 to 19 Celsius. Thanks, Sarah. And that's all from the East Midlands today, this Bank Holiday Monday. We're back with our first news bulletin at 6.25 tomorrow morning. Have a very good night. Get the headlines every 15 minutes on BBC News 24. BBC News, whenever you need to know. Good evening. Well, as bank holidays go, I suppose we give this one, what, five, six, seven out of ten. There was some sunshine, yes, but some fairly heavy showers around too. And I can tell you there's plenty more rain to come as we go through the rest of this week. It's hardly surprising by uh, looking at the satellite picture. There is a huge train of cloud extending way out west into the Atlantic. If I move to one side, you can see a developing head to that cloud and that'll be heading towards us later on this week bringing some proper wet weather but at the moment the cloud remains uh, fairly well broken across the uk still a few showers around but uh, generally they'll become more confined to northwest and facing coasts inland largely clear skies and turning into uh, quite a chilly night by uh, the end of the night temperatures in northern areas getting down into single figures the other end of the uk rather more cloud developing across at the far southwest of england with the odd spot of rain so uh, a damp start across cornwall perhaps but for many it'll be a bright and breezy start to tuesday with some sunshine around but uh, just like today showers will develop quite widely uh, through the day migrating their way slowly eastwards i'll try and pick out some regional detail because i think by the afternoon things will be picking up across southwestern parts of england it's four o'clock the cloud will thin out and the showers will die away so some lengthy spells of sunshine here through the afternoon for south wales too i think uh, there'll be uh, plenty of dry weather just the odd shower most of the showers further north across wales Across the Irish Sea, well, I think the showers will keep peppering Northern Ireland for much of the day, feeling quite cool in the breeze. And for Western Scotland too, perhaps, perhaps further east across Scotland with a bit more shelter, you might see rather more sunshine, but uh, still some sharp showers around through the afternoon, extending down through the spine of Northern England. As I mentioned, they'll be migrating slowly eastwards through the day. Still some large holes in the clouds, so some pleasant spells of sunshine across parts of the Midlands and East Anglia. Some sharp showers down across the southeast, holding those temperatures down 20 degrees at best in the sunshine. A bright, fresh start in the east on Wednesday. More rain arriving from the west. Good night. That was the 10 o'clock news, and next it's not the 9 o'clock news here on BBC One with Comedy Connections. <laughs> Outrageous. And Unpredictable. And a total scream. It's a crash! Take a ride with Little Miss Jocelyn tomorrow at 10.30 or watch online now.